teaching a business school course for the last seven years. In that course, I had the students do a role play, where I play the CEO, and they have to convince me to adopt a strategy that they've just come up with. I've taught this course 18 times, and a third of the time, the student comes confidently up to the front of the room, shakes my hand, looks me in the eye, and says, good morning, Mr. CEO. They did a study with Asian women, and they had them take a math test. And they knew that all these Asian women had the same mathematical ability, because they'd had to take a previous math test. This time, they divided them into two groups. The first group, they reminded them of their Asian-ness. So, where were your parents born? What language do you speak at home? What food do you eat at home? You're Asian, you're Asian, you're Asian. The second group, they asked them questions like, what makeup brands do you wear? Did you live in a co-ed dorm? What hair products do you use? You're women, you're women, you're women. The Asian women that were reminded of their Asian-ness did 20% better on the math test than the Asian women who were reminded of their women-ness. Why? Because Asians are good at math, and women are bad at math. I share these two stories because they highlight biases that we are all impacted by and that we all actually have. And I know right now some of you are thinking, Angela, I don't have these biases. I don't believe that only men can be CEOs. I don't believe that women aren't good at math. Well, to those of you, I encourage you to go online and take Harvard's implicit bias test. You might be surprised. I know I certainly was. Now, these biases impact us in so many different ways, but today I specifically want to talk about how it impacts the female entrepreneur. Investors have bias as well. Today, only 4% of venture capitalists are women. And guess what? Only 4% of the venture capital funding is going towards women-led startups. And it doesn't stop at funding. I remember when I started a company with a male co-founder, and we would have client meetings. More often than not, a male client with my male co-founder essentially having a one-on-one -on -one meeting, forgetting that I was in the room. Or bringing a male intern into a senior-level meeting with me, because I wanted him to experience what was going on in that meeting, and having people assume that he was my boss. These days, I'm on the other side as an investor, and I repeatedly see men and women as co-founders pitching, but then all of the questions getting directed to the male co-founder after the pitch. Female entrepreneurs are doubly hampered, because on the one hand, investors have bias, but then women themselves are holding themselves back because of their own lack of confidence, something that I know a lot of us have heard about, this confidence gap. I'm lucky enough to get to sit in on a lot of business school classes, and I like to watch participation patterns, what's happening in the classroom. Now, a statistic you guys might be familiar with is that 30% of business school classes are comprised of women. But only 10% of the questions and comments in that classroom are coming from women. And what's scarier is when I sit in on those classes, the thing that I keep noticing over and over again is if you have women making comments, they're for the most part in the second half of a 90-minute class. Now, I have some guesses as to why. Maybe women don't want to be the first woman to speak up. Maybe they need some time to warm up before they raise their hand in front of the professor in the entire class. But I do know this. Most business meetings are 60 minutes long. If we all wait too long to warm up and to get comfortable, our voice is not going to get heard in those meetings. All of this creates an incredibly vicious cycle. Women, because of their own lack of confidence, are asking for less money when they're fundraising. Investors have bias, and so they get less money. And that means that women entrepreneurs have less money to run and grow their startups. It means that today we have fewer female CEOs of large, visibly successful startups. And guess what? That means today, young female budding entrepreneurs don't have role models to look up to that look like and sound like them. And that confidence gap expands. Now, I know I've painted a somewhat bleak picture here, but there is something that every single one of us can do. We can be bias breakers. And what does that mean? The first word I want all of us to remember is the word nudge. I want each of us to be nudging each other to step out of our comfort zones. Right now, there are women who are thinking, you know what, I might want to invest in startups. That sounds really interesting. I know a lot of those women are also thinking, but you know what, I don't know if I'm qualified. We need to nudge each other to listen to that first voice and not listen to the second voice. 
And walking into the world of angel investing is incredibly difficult. Um, I did it myself about eight years ago and would literally walk into these investor meetings and these rooms were filled with old white men and no one looked like me. And I got asked if I was lost. I got asked who I worked for. And my favorite question was I would get asked by entrepreneurs, what does your husband do? Should I be talking to him? <laughs> this is why we need to be nudging each other to step out of those comfort zones. I don't know if you guys know this, but women are 40% less likely than men to apply for a job they feel underqualified for. And that is why when we hear our roommates, our female colleagues, our girlfriends say something like, you know what, that promotion sounds amazing. I'm gonna go for it next year. Or that job offer sounds, that job sounds so cool, but you know what, I'm not qualified. They're never gonna hire me. I'm not even gonna apply. We need to be nudging each other to step out of our comfort zones and grasp onto those opportunities. The other thing is I want us all to be double-checking our own decisions. And what I mean by that is the next time we're hiring somebody, the next time we are voting for somebody into student office, I just want us to pause and ask ourselves, is there implicit bias here holding me back? Is there a lens that I'm applying to this decision that shouldn't be there? Just asking us all to pause and double check our decisions. And then lastly, every single one of us should be out there mentoring. We all have stories and successes to be sharing, especially with the young women in the world. And even more importantly, I want us to be sharing our stumbles. Now, failure is very much the topic du jour these days. Everyone loves talking about failure. And we've all been to those amazing conferences where there is this fabulously successful person giving a keynote, talking about the catastrophic failure they had 10 years ago that they overcame. And we need to hear those stories. But even more so, we need to be talking about the stumbles that happened last week, the stumbles that happened yesterday, the stumbles that we are in the middle of right now that we don't quite know how to get out of. Because it's not how we behave when things are going wonderfully that defines us as leaders, it's how we pick ourselves up from those stumbles. And so we need to be sharing them. I talk to entrepreneurs on a daily basis, and whenever I first ask them, how are things going? The response is always, things are awesome, we're crushing it. And if you are, awesome. But if you're not, share your stumbles and ask for help. There is tremendous power in this room and in rooms that look, that look like this all over the world. We need to be unleashing that power and we are obligated to nudge each other to step out of our comfort zones, to be double checking our own decisions, to be sharing our stumbles, especially the current ones. And with that, we can dare to break through bias. Thank you.